Black spatial humanities is a subfield of the spatial humanities in which uh, we are trying to find out more about the history of African descended peoples globally. So we really are trying to understand what it means to be African in diaspora and the ways in which we can begin to look at uh, forms of institutional racism that have shaped uh, African descended peoples experiences. And in my own work, I look at the ways in which uh, the apartheid government imposed certain kinds of restrictions on African descended people and essentially tried to control their daily lives in different kinds of ways, from where they lived to where they worked. And what is really important there is to try to understand that despite those kinds of forms of control, uh, there was resistance going on in those daily lives. And how do we sort of document and map and, and really tell the narratives of those different forms of resisting against that kind of form of social control is what the Black Spatial Humanities is really trying to focus on. I think one of the things we're really trying to grasp um, is can the user, can the person who's experiencing these environments find empathy in any way for the kinds of experiences of the people that you might be you know, looking at, you're looking into their daily lives? And is there a way perhaps for one to get a sense of not just what something like segregation was or apartheid was, but can you really get at sort of the nitty gritty ways in which you moved through your daily life and those forms of control really impacted the way one, one sort of experienced life? So, I think empathy is one of the ways. Um, one of the things we really would like to, to, to have sort of revealed through these 3D recreations, reconstructions. Um, but also, in a sense, um, much of this work is based on trying to get at those lost histories that don't exist anymore. Uh, one of the things we're, we're trying to do, and it is contemporary history, it's 20th century history, that we're trying to reconstruct maybe even late 19th century history, um, is that many of these locations are being destroyed for tourist purposes. And that destruction um, has happened, and what we haven't seen is the documentation of these particular places. And we don't really understand the loss to the broader narrative of liberation um, in a place like South Africa in the fight against uh, apartheid. One of the most recent ways that we've um, tried to expose some of the injustices brought about by the apartheid government um, is in the Nelson Mandela home. Uh, we developed a, a new platform called the Social Justice History Platform. And in that, we are trying to combine video testimony embedded within a 3D environment using the Unity platform as a way to provide not just the reconstruction, but the kinds of testimony that one can sort of reveal about some of these human rights violations. So in the case of um, the visualization we recently made, uh, one begins to see uh, the ways in which someone like Winnie Mandela, who spent many years incarcerated actually in her own home, had to adjust her living spaces in order to be able to protect her children. The wall that uh, was dividing the, the rooms to uh, make a sitting room, a lounge, and a kitchen, I built that wall. So one of the stories she tells is about the building of a wall between uh, the living room and the kitchen, and how this wall was actually a protective wall that she had put in because police forces and armed security would stand outside her home and fire their guns at will into the home, hoping to kill or at least hurt her and her daughters. So she tells a very moving story about having to build this wall and to make sure that her daughters understood that the reason the wall was there was not to divide up their space even further, uh, living in, in rather small cramped spaces, but it was in fact a form of protection. And, and you wouldn't really know that particular history if you just walked into the house and, and encountered this wall and there was no kind of narrative about it. So in this 3D reconstruction, we are really able to tell that story in Winnie's own words. She gets to tell that story through her video testimony. 
So we get to hear about the ways in which she not only had to build the wall, but the ways in which um, she felt it was an important part of the house's narrative of, of that kind of heritage that needed to be recorded. It was a typical township house, you know, a two-roomed house. I never forgave her father for getting that particular house. I think in our broader work, as we see in the field of digital humanities, um, identity is still a very thorny issue. Um, issues of difference, issues of diversity are still uh, something that most folks don't want to talk about because it exposes the kind of inequalities that not only exist, I think, in our daily lives, but I think the broader concern is actually the kinds of inequalities that it exposes actually in the academic world. So. It's, it's really important and imperative to tell these stories. And in South Africa, the challenge there is, is that many folks actually didn't tell their whole truths or their whole stories, um, particularly to something like the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which was hugely successful. But in fact, people edited out some of the specifics about the kind of work that they were doing, the kind of clandestine work they were doing. So, as an ethnographer, there's a challenge implicit in the work, not just trying to get those unearthed stories out, but there's a challenge there legally uh, when one is trying to tell that narrative that maybe they didn't tell the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. In fact, one of the women I've had the pleasure of interviewing uh, told a very moving story about traveling in a truck full of students, this was in the mid-1970s, as she was transporting students to Swaziland. And she did get caught, and the one time she got caught, she, she tells, you know, in this rather moving narrative, but in fact, she never told that story to the TRC. You take on a certain kind of responsibility as the researcher to your research subjects because they aren't really research subjects, they're research partners, they're collaborators. And they want the stories being told, but there's this difficult negotiation that has to happen then. And in some ways, as the digital humanist, um, I get pretty concerned about the kind of jeopardy I might be putting them in um, if these stories get told online and in a public way. Uh, but they clearly want those stories to get told. You know, they are part of this process and they say, we want the stories because no one has bothered to say they're important. So there's a lot of push and pull there that one has to negotiate um, and really think through carefully that um, in the U.S. Is, is something that you can't quite address in your institutional review board application. Uh, in particular, uh, how do you sort of work that in and, and how do you sort of uh, meet those particular standards, especially when you're working and embedded in community and when you know, you're a partner with them. So there's some real challenges there.